Hello everyone, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for um, having me. And my contribution to this series really is um, from a personal perspective uh, as someone that's living on the land that really is looking to transition to more sustainable land use. So it's not really a scholarly presentation, just a lot of observation and communication with like-minded people. Quickly about us, we're a family-run operation. We've been living mostly in the Central West or for all my life in the Central West and um, Queensland. And we've been running an organic operation out there for the better part of 20 years. And despite always caring about the land and wanting to look after it and leave it in a better condition, as everyone usually says, we have noticed a decline in different um, areas of our pasture and in different parts of the landscape and both on our property and in the area and that has led us eventually to considering and now transitioning across to more regenerative practices. I've listed a few of the things that we've done uh, on the different properties we have. We also have some coastal country but uh, the main thing that we really have been focusing on and the biggest shift for us is just a change in our grazing management style. So moving away from set stocking and into timed rotational grazing or planned rotational grazing although you know the planning can be a bit haphazard here and there but we are working on it and I think that's an important thing to impart is um, I certainly don't consider myself a regenerative guru. Um, we're just at the start of our journey and really if more people were a little bit um, open about that and not expecting perfection or massive changes all happening overnight then we might have you know a few more people comfortable about sticking their hands up and saying yep yeah, I'm making that transition. So we may have, my parents and I agreed now on the way forward, uh, oh, I mean that's still ongoing debate about the nitty gritties of what we should and shouldn't do, but uh, in terms of getting that change in mindset that then allows you to make that transformational change um, in your landscape through a change in management, getting to that point can be different for different people. And we hear a lot, particularly in regenerative circles, about sort of relying on a crisis to happen, to sort of like catapult you into this change of management. But it doesn't actually have to happen that way. That can be um, pretty traumatic for some people to, to go through that journey, even if it is, you know, a very good way of pioneering new methods. Um, but personally, my interest... Um, in alternative management and regenerative management was sparked quite a few years ago. The people who are already into regen and grazing will recognise some of these slides. They are from the Savory Institute, um, a la even Alan Savory. And basically it was just, um, I first witnessed it in email version quite, quite a long time ago. So as you can see, Zimbabwe, Australia, Mexico, Namibia and um, a desert in South Africa, so a lot of brittle and arid environments. And that certainly sparked my imagination and also interest in, oh, aha, are there other things that we could be doing that would really benefit and help us to restore our landscape but also, like, have a thriving, healthy, vibrant ecosystem around us and a healthy business um, because Central Western Queensland, as a lot of other areas in Australia, has an extremely volatile climate uh, and that combined with sort of unintentional mismanagement and degradation through certain conventional practices doesn't leave a lot of fat in the system. I did pass this on to my folks at the time um, and, and this is where the interesting thing in everyone's journey being different is um, for whatever reason it didn't really cut through at the time and it wasn't until quite a few years later um, that I started saying no I really am not comfortable in this pathway and I want to make significant changes um, that I started listening to, you know, what were dad's concerns around that and what did he need to interest him and make him sort of look at alternative methods. And one thing he kept saying, and we really need to take this into account, is that um, he wanted to know, uh, he wanted to talk to people that had been practising alternative methods in an area similar to us with low rainfall, with extensive operations. Um, sorry, we're not super low. It's 16 inch per annum rainfall um, when it does rain. <laughs> we're in a middle of, oh, well, I hope they're not the middle, but we're in an eight year drought at the moment. And so I, I, I took that on board and I, I said to, to some uh, colleague up here, I said, oh, I, I really need to find a successful regenerative grazier in an arid area and we actually ironically ended up having a Skype conversation not with someone in Australia but with some ranchers in Mexico 
So there's a group of ranchers over there that are doing some incredible work reversing desertification in the Chihuahua Desert. And this Skype conversation that we had was sort of the little spark for Dad. It was the moment where he said he was able to ask people questions that concerned him about how it would or wouldn't work. People that were used to similar challenges that he was used to, even if they weren't in the same country. <laughs> um, and it's not to say there aren't people doing this in Australia, but at the time, we were finding it hard to locate them. And the thing that interested me out of this and that I took for, forward and I still think about a lot today and that I think we need to work into our models is this idea of collaboration. So this group of ranchers actually collaborated with wildlife conservation groups, bird conservation groups, and those groups actually, to my understanding, helped contribute some of the capital that was needed to install infrastructure, i.e. fencing, watering points, to enable that landscape restoration, to enable that pasture revival to happen, which then, you know, helped them tick off goals, you know, the ranchers were happy, the conservation groups were happy because it was a return of more wildlife and birds. And so I, I just felt that was a really fitting model. And then if you combine that sort of this idea of finding other people to talk to, doing some research, learning some more things, you'll find that that actually encourages you to be more observant on your own land. So previously where I might have looked out and seen a whole pasture of grass and just said, oh, that's what looks healthy or it doesn't. <laughs> now I drive around and I take photos like these. So, you know, I'm driving around and going, oh, okay, well, here's a clay pan and there's a cross here and there's not a lot growing. But anywhere where you see growth, it's where debris is gathered, etc. So, you know, it's no rocket science, like places to gather water and shelter the earth, et cetera, and just highlights the importance of ground cover. But the point being that the more you learn, the more you observe what is around you, the more that feeds into your curiosity to learn more. And at a certain point, you may need, and everyone's different, but a lot of people will need that sort of like peer-to-peer -peer support in order to actually implement change, in order to actually put practices in place because it's one thing to you know, read a book and understand a theory, but it's another thing to then, especially if you're running under a very tight margin to go and put that in place on your land. And I think that's a really crucial point. So if you're aiming for transformative change, um, you really need to understand and accommodate for the culture of those communities that desire change or that you are concerned and you would like to see change in. Um, especially in terms of culture, you know, uh, you might think, oh, well, we should just regulate, you know, people to do X, Y, and Z and we'll make it policy and, you know, we'll have these auditors going or something. Um, if you understood the culture of that region, you might think, oh, actually, that won't work. That won't be a very effective. Um, you might cause a, re a revolt. <laughs> and so what would be better is if you really identify the people on the ground that were doing interesting things, that were finding effective methods, that had like-minded goals, and you really chose to support them and create sort of like a nucleus of energy that you can then create change with, which can then be supported by positive policies um, or government-assisted assisted research and development, for example. Um, and then just to stress that point, going back to Dad's concerns, and I've seen this a million times um, in my community and spoken to people from other networks that have had the same comment is, um, people do want to know that something will work in their region and they like to talk to someone that they trust and know about it. Um, it I see, I, and, and probably even within the, the beautiful, vibrant, regenerative networks that um, I move in and communicate in, which is full of fabulous people, but there is a tendency to jump on and say, oh, well, we shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. And, and, and why are you doubting that this will work? Because it'll work anywhere. And that idea of just saying it'll work anywhere, it'll work on your land if you haven't taken the time to get to know where that person's coming from, what their concerns are, what the challenges specific to the region are, then you're probably not going to create much effective change at all. So it's really understanding the culture of an area, the needs of the people in those areas and trying to be able to meet their concerns, provide data, um, and help connect them with other like-minded people so that there is a support network so they can bounce information off of each other. This is just, again, going to that idea of like continual learning, 
continual observation, wondering what's happening here. Um, out of interest, the bottom left slide is, that's in our, our Bunnings where we get our material that's pre-used, although those look like they could go to the dump now. Uh, the grass inside that ring lock is, as you can see, nearly to the top of that um, ring lock there. And the only grazing pressure really in that area has been kangaroos. And so it just goes to show that there's, you know, I'm sure kangaroos is a widespread issue, but there are certain areas where some challenges are more pressing than others, and they're not always a simple management fix, and they're also not easy to deal with ethically sometimes, so there's quite a few social issues that can be involved in that. The capacity for land to regenerate itself is incredible. It can be very daunting and depressing looking at a, a brown moonscape, but you know, I've, I've seen time and time again these plants come back out of nowhere and I think if we can just harness the right energy, get the right policies in place to support the right networks and encourage people to be catalysts, then we can really make significant differences in probably a shorter amount of time than we realise. But all of this takes energy and I think a huge thing is knowing your why. And most people will probably, when it comes down to it, have overlapping reasons why they want to restore landscape or why they want to, you know, improve the profitability of their business or the management of their land. So for me, my why that fuels me is I want to live in a thriving landscape. I want a, an abundance of life around me. I want to see my family and my community happy and healthy and have a resilient and profitable business. There's been a lot of population uh, drift away from rural towns in our region and I'm sure across many regional areas of Australia and so it shouldn't be hard to find people that have common goals. What we need to do is to find those people with the vision, drive and capacity to be catalysts for change and harness that energy. So we need to support that energy within communities and build it up, build the change from there. So in a ground up approach. Um, there are usually existing social and industry networks that can be tapped into. So land care and NRM groups, um, lobbying groups. Um, potentially ag force etc and I know I've been guilty of this myself but there can sometimes be a situation where if if you're an outsider that hasn't engaged with those groups I mean not an outsider you live in the area but you haven't engaged with them and you look at the work they currently do and you think that doesn't align with you know my belief systems or perhaps um that the things that they recommend aren't things that I do in my work and my management style then there's a tendency to not bother to engage and I think uh and this is my next step <laughs> is to then engage because if we can identify some like-minded people in our area and then also engage with our local existing networks and just see if there is room for collaboration I think that that is sort of the key to creating some change that then has its own momentum and it's not just sort of all on your shoulders you have a group and that creates its own synergy and if I didn't need any more why, apart from degradation through unintentional mismanagement and quite often this is linked to mounting financial pressure and debt loads, climate change is, is just this force that, you know, you can't really hide from. So we have to do our best um, to make ourselves as resilient as possible and adapt. Those pictures are just, you know, an illustration a lot of grazies would be familiar with, but just, you know, what a heat wave can do to fresh seedlings and that's some melted pigweed in the bottom there. But where there is threat, there is opportunity. So I like to think that this present point in time is really the perfect storm. We've got a convergence of interests. We've got um, obviously so much focus around climate change, which, yes, it is a threat, but it's also an opportunity because of the amount of pressure, because of the amount of funding, the amount of investment that's going towards climate change and addressing climate change, and then you layer that with the rise of the ethical consumer, concerns around biodiversity loss, importance of waterways. We've got the Murray-Darling Basin, for example, of the issues that are quite high profile down there. And at the same time, this really surge in uptake in terms of regenerative agriculture and enrolment in training and events and things like this is really indicating that that's, you know, a rising area of interest and there's a lot of reasons for that. But I feel like this is the point where we can really leverage solutions that may not have had the amount of support previously that they would have now. Um, so carbon farming, um, for example, or payment for ecosystem services um, and environmental outcomes. So I recently, uh, well, a while ago, 
spoke to Andrew Ward from Ethical Fields and they've got a really interesting model they're working on with farmers forming mutuals, so effectively groups that can then access payments for ecosystem services in a way that sort of makes it simpler because it's, um, you know, we hear all the time there's a lot of money in that area, but accessing it as a farmer or a grazier has sort of been a, a mystical uh, and off-putting process at this point. So that's one thing I recommend people looking up. I'm sure there are other models, but it's promising to see this emergence of new models and support mechanisms for landscape restoration and regenerative agriculture. So just to recap, um, the things that I think are most important moving forwards, if we really want to increase uptake of regenerative management practices and landscape restoration is really focusing on you know, the creation of and support of peer-to-peer -peer support networks and also identifying catalysts that can sort of help, help create um, the energy for those networks um, and other supportive mechanisms. So I've just sort of got a little montage here. Um, there are a few lists in the sources where I've, I've mentioned a few of these um, individuals and groups. Uh, they're not all massive, you know, I haven't chosen massively high profile groups, although the Regenerative Ag group is, um, that's just a social group, but interestingly enough, there's over 18,000 members. So there's very healthy discussions going on and online is obviously much easier um, to get these greater numbers. But in terms of actually making differences within your community, there's some great examples there I'd encourage you to go and have a look at. For example, Tim and Amber Scott at Kendanga. They've got a farm store there. They've got their own farm. They're really all about, yes, they've got a, a business, but they're also really about contributing to a community and really invigorating that community with the common goals of looking after the land and nature and feeding people healthy food. And then we've got obviously your paid services. So RCS, that's a really popular model. Going to attend one of those shortly actually, but just this idea that there's plenty of training and education out there to be accessed. But if we can give people the opportunity to network regardless of what um, system they subscribe to, then you get a lot of cross-pollination and also encouragement to go and do that further training and also just that follow-up to make sure people actually do implement um, implement some change on the ground. So um, that's it for me really. Um, those are the things that I, I've been mostly concerning myself with um, that I've been thinking a lot of in terms of, you know, how do we really encourage this uptake and, and really wanting to see a community approach to this. Um, and I would really encourage anyone that um, has been working in the field of creating networks um, or interested in regenerative grazing um, and landscape restoration, if they see an overlap there, then, yeah, by all means, get in touch and I will give my details to the wonderful hosts and I look forward to the rest of this series and seeing what collaboration comes out of it. Thank you.